Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. We can have a good time in you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for this message. And Lord, that our hearts are open. And as we share this, this is going to be a time of revelation. It's going to answer questions for us. It's going to let us see and understand what you're doing and our part in this amazing, uh, uh, this amazing uh, victory that you are outplaying in the earth right now. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as I sort of said, I'm going to uh, share for the next few weeks on um, end times, God's prophetic time clock. And so this morning I want to do a, lay a foundation and uh, talk about the dispensations uh, that um, God has set in the earth and to understand that because um, end times is very much interlinked with the dispensations of God. And, uh, and you'll understand and hear uh, that in just a moment. Next week I want to talk about the rapture of the church. And it's good news for the believers and then uh, in, the pre in the next few weeks after that, I want to talk about uh, what, where does Israel fit in end times? Where does the nations fit? So where is the church? Where does she fit in end times? Where does Israel fit? And where do the nations fit? And I believe it's, an abs it's good news for us. It's a message of victory for us. And so um, praise the Lord. Everyone's got an outline? If you haven't, put your hands up and that would be cool. Um, and so where does the church fit? I'm just going to read my notes so I don't get excited and take off. So there's been much discussion over the years and a lot of speculation about end times and about the rapture um, of the church. And there's been a lot of controversy uh, concerning the rapture. And that's, you know, that's what we're going to speak about next week. But I'll, I'll have a quick look at that before we look at dispensations. Um, there's been speculation on the Antichrist. If you've been around for a wee while, there was Henry Kissinger that was supposed to be the Antichrist. And there's all these kind of names that have floated ar around um, to, to know who he will be. And we'll have a look and see that the Antichrist will not be able to be revealed until we've left the earth. And then the son of position will um, take, his, take his place on the, world, on the world map or on the world scene. And so um, I remember as a new believer in 1979, coming back to New Zealand in 1980. And uh, there was teaching on end times. We had um, the old evangelist, um, Barry Smith. He used end time teaching. He was actually an evangelist, but he used the end time message to bring a harvest of people into the kingdom. It was actually marvelous. And we were down the South Island at the time, and we'd gone to uh, meetings uh, where he was, and it was, ah, oh, you know, it was, it was quite fantastic. And... Um, it was interesting, at that same time, there was a movie that uh, was released called Left Behind. Does anybody remember that movie, any of us? Left Behind, and as the title suggests, uh, some people were going to be left behind. <laughs> and uh, some people thought that, that they were going to be left behind and have to go through the tribulation. And that was a real thing at that time. Uh, there was that, that, that kind of stirred fear in the body of Christ. Um, and a lot of Christians were fearful, and they were, t you know, reading scriptures in Matthew 24, 25, and thinking, oh, one will be taken, another left, one will be taken, another left, you know, and two will be working in the field, and they were kind of quoting this, and everybody was wondering if they were going to be the ones left. Um, and, and, and so there was fear in the body of Christ. Not only that, when, when we under thought, in fact, could I have my volumes turned up a wee bit in the fallbacks or something? I don't feel like I'm loud enough. <clears throat> for myself. <laughs> um, the other thing was that we thought, well, if Jesus is coming back, and this was kind of an unspoken sense, well, what was the point in studying, putting all that time into study? What was the point in buying a house? And we had kind of hopped on that bandwagon for a while and thought, well, well we're not going to buy a house. My parents were thinking, look, you know, you're married, now you need to buy a house. No, 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 Jesus is coming back. <laughs> And my parents are thinking, oh gosh, they've lost the plot. They've lost the plot. And so my parents were just, um, you know, again, we were young, you know, young, early, early 20s. And my, my parents thought, thought it was just crazy. And, and it was. Because Jesus said, occupy till I come. And so the problem with some of that teaching was that the church withdrew from society the light withdrew from society and wasn't pushing herself forward and being a voice in the nation. And so you take out the light and then darkness can come into places of authority. 
And really, that's what happened in the 80s. You just sort of see a down, uh, you know, a downward trend, um, and and people, you know, the, the education board, you know, got impacted. And there was a lot of stuff. And I mean, I'm not, I'm sort of probably generalising, but Jesus said, "Occupy till I come." And so this message needs to be spoken and it needs to be taught so that the church knows where we stand, what we're supposed to be doing, and so that we can then move forward and do the job that God's called us to do. And so, um, again, Jesus said, occupy till I come. And so this just, just I mean, I'll cover it next week, but this con con conflicting um, teaching that was out at the time was that this was th three theories uh, about the rapture. There was the pre-tribulation rapture, because you had the seven years of tribulation, which we'll look at um, at some point. Um, and so there was people like us now that think, hey, it's pre-tribulation rapture. We are not going to go through the tribulation. We have not been called to judgment, but to life. And so we're out of here. God's taking his ambassadors home before war is announced on the earth. And so we totally believe that, and we'll look at scriptures next week that confirm that, many scriptures. You have the um, mid-tribulation rapture um, theorists uh, that believe that um, the church is going through the tribulation for half, three and a half years, halfway through, and then we're getting taken out. They get that, um, they get that um, teaching from Revelations, where you read, I think it's in Revelation 6 or 7, where there's a whole, a whole myriad of people arriving in heaven from the earth, clothed in white. And a voice says, who are these people? And the voice answers and says, oh, these are they who have come out of great tribulation. And people thought, oh, my gosh, that's us. You know, we've come out of great tribulation. We've been martyred and, and taken up. Um, yes, there are going to be people that are going to be martyred during the tribulation. And they're going to be arriving in heaven. But that is not the church. Those are the tribulation saints. When we're raptured out of here, there is going to be a myriad, millions of people, possibly billions of people that will bow their knee to Jesus Christ and get born again uh, because now they realize this is real. And those people are not the church because the church is no longer here. They're tribulation saints. And yes, they will, they will go through incredible persecution. And then you have the, uh, the final um, people that believe that the, the, the church, the believers are going to go through the uh, tribulation right to the end, uh, which is not possible because um, if we get raptured out of here, Jesus will rise back with his saints. So it's going to be, whoo, whoo, I don't know how we're going to do that. Go up, get raptured, quickly come back down with Jesus. No, no, no. We're going up at the beginning. Before the, before the tribulation starts. And we're going to be having the marriage supper of the Lamb. And there's going to be the reward seat of Christ. And it's just going to be a magnificent time. And so we're going to have a look at that next week. But you see, Satan would like nothing more than for the church to think that he's more powerful than us and that he's going to persecute us and take us down and he's going to um, be given that opportunity and, uh, and put people into fear. And, um, you know, the Bible talks about that Satan can oppress us and put us down if we're operating and walking in fear. But we're not. We're not the fearful church. We're the overcoming church. We're the victorious church, that Satan's under our feet, and that Satan cannot do what he wants to do in the earth while we're here. And the more that we understand that and know that, that the more that we can use our authority and say, no, devil, you're not doing that in our nation. No government, you're not making those rules. We are the spiritual police force and authority in this nation, and we will not allow you to do that. When we understand who we are and what authority we carry and be a voice, um, that's what God wants. Praise God. And so let's have a look here on your outline. God does not want us to be ignorant concerning end times. And so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, it's interesting that the 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, Paul was writing to the Thessalonian church, um, and he was actually speaking about end times. And so a lot of end time teaching is taken from Corinthians, letters to the church where Paul was talking to the Corinthian church, he was talking to the church of Thessalonica, and he was telling them, listen, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have no hope. 
And so those who have no hope are the people that are unsaved. Um, but we have a hope. We have a hope that we've already passed from death to life. That we've already passed from judgment to life. That God is not pouring out judgment on his church. He poured out judgment on Jesus Christ. And he made us um, free and guilt and, 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 and guilt free. And so Paul just says here that I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, that you sorrow not as others do who have no hope. If you go all the way through to the second, um, the, the fifth chapter, he goes on and, he, and you know that he's actually talking about end times. And so let's have a look, number three. So how can we accurately interpret scripture and the end time events? Well, there's biblical keys, there's biblical understanding that we need to apply to the scripture in order for us to interpret scripture correctly. And if we don't use those keys, we're going to get things mixed up. And so the first key is the Bible identifies three groups of people. You've got Israel, you've got the church, and you've got the nations. Okay, so you've got Israel as a group of people, you've got the church, which is a different group of people, and then you've got the nations. And God works with those three groups of people, and there's scriptures that are specifically spoken to the church that do not apply to Israel or the nations. The scriptures that God is speaking to Israel has got nothing to do with the church. It's recorded in the Bible for us to read, but it doesn't apply to us. So we need to and, and correctly interpret scripture. We need to understand who's God talking to. Who are you talking to? Jesus, who were you talking to in Matthew 24, 25? He was talking to Israel because the church wasn't even born at that stage. The church was not in the earth. It couldn't be in the earth until he died, rose again, and the day of Pentecost came, and then the church began. The church age began. And so when we're looking at Scripture, who's he talking to? And so, again, so the second key um, that we need to understand is Bible dispensations. And we're going to have a look at that, and, it's good, and there's some exciting things that we can learn there. And so that second key to accurately understand Bible interpretation is to understand dispensations, that God is a God of order. He's not random in what he does. There is a, a, he's orderly, he's structured in everything he does. And when we understand that and understand how he has operated in times past, it just gives us confidence. And it even answers and will answer some questions why God's not you know, pouring out judgments on nations right now like he did during um, Moses' time. It's a different dispensation. The rules are different. And so let's have a look at this big word, dispensations, and have a look and see. It says, dispensationalism is an approach to Bible interpretation which states God uses different means of working with people during different periods of history. So he uses different rules. It's like a different game plan. It's like rugby. The rules of rugby are a set of rules that you cannot apply to soccer. If you do, you're going to be given a, ye a yellow ticket, a red ticket, a green ticket, every ticket, and sent off the field. <laughs> and so God does not use different rules for the different dispensations. It's just not going to happen. And so we under when we understand that, we're going to work with the things that God has already set up. And so I believe that when we understand the dispensations, it's going to help us to interpret end times scripture. Not only that, it's going to give us an understanding of why Angels aren't visiting us right now and speaking to us and giving us instructions. Why, you know, we haven't got a fire that's following us during the night. <laughs> and why there's not a cloud covering us when we walk down the street during the day, you know, the glory of God. And why water is not coming out of a rock. I mean, wow. You know, it's amazing. These people lived with this miraculous manifestations. And yet, you know, people are running around the nations right now looking for signs and wonders and miracles. That does not change a person's heart. The children of Israel lived with this miracles, the manifestation of Elohim for 40 years. And they were a stiff-necked, rebellious generation that ended up dying in that wilderness. And so it's not necessarily the miraculous that's going to change the hearts of, of people, which is interesting. Praise the Lord. Are you out there? Okay, 
All right, I might get everybody to stand up and do a few things like this and make sure no one's going to sleep on my watch. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look here. What, where do we get this scripture from that God works with different people? Let's have a look here, that God worked with people during different dispensations in different ways. We get this from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. So it says here that God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. So it says here that God in various times, so there's various time periods, he spoke in various ways has in these last days spoken to us by his son. And so there's a lot of stuff that's in just in these two scriptures. In fact, ushers, do you want to open the doors? And, there's, there's a, just, and put some fresh air in the place. I'm hot up here. And I don't want to take my coat off. Yeah, maybe put the air conditioning on or something would be cool. Okay, so let's have a look here and I'll break this down, otherwise I'm going to take too long. Verse 1, it speaks about the Old Testament periods and calls them various times. Various times or times past. In verse 2, he's speaking to the New Testament, a New Testament period, and he's calling it in these last days. So the last days have been for 2,000 years. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's a, um, a, a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, in fact, the book um, of Acts, he talks about Paul, um, Peter has said that, that the, in these last days, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out on all flesh. And so we're in that time. Have a look here again. Hebrews chapter 1, it says here, it tells us that the Old Testament was divided into various time periods. But then in verse 2, that the New Testament is one period, one time period. And then in the Old Testament, it says that God spoke to people in various ways. But in the church age, God speaks to us by his son through his word. Interesting. Interesting. And then the Old Testament is primarily, it's directed to the Jews. When God was looking for a nation and looking for a people that he could bring this covenant, this everlasting covenant. And then in the New Testament, God's speaking to the church. And so we can have a look, and I just want us to spend some time just going through the, these dispensations and say, okay, God, if in times past that you spoke to us, what are these different, what are these different dispensations and, and what were they about? Um, and it'll give us some understanding. So we had the dispensation of innocence. Then after innocence came the dispensation of conscience. Then came human government. Then came the dispensation of promise. And then came the dispensation of the law. Then came the dispensation of grace, which we're in. And then the millennial, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And so if we have a look here and, and look at a description of those, it's interesting that we have a look and see that each one of these dispensations, God started them. God started them and men, and they were started in righteousness and man ended up with sin. And then God came in again and he would start another, another set of rules, another game plan, and then man, man would mess up. And, and it would end with sin, and then God would come in again. You can see all through the ages, the grace of God visiting man in his son. Right from the very beginning when there was the, um, the time of innocence with Adam and Eve, and then it ended in sin, and God had a plan to bring forth his Savior. And so then we came in. And we came into the, um, the dispensation of consciousness. So let's just quickly read this here. So the dispensation of innocence began with when God created man. He placed him in the garden and ended with a fall. You've got the dispensation of conscience, which began after the fall of man and it ended in the flood. It's the grace of God that the whole earth at that time was wicked. There was no one left on the earth. God found one man, Noah. And uh, here, here he is. He's preaching for 120 years and gets no converts. That's pretty, pretty discouraging, wouldn't you think? Well, he got his family. Imagine that. I mean, we're in a time frame right now, and, and we can get discouraged thinking, God, why aren't you moving? How about these guys? We read their story, and then we just read it with like, you know, three chapters in a book. This is 120 years, this guy is in a wicked generation, cursing God. God visits him, he builds this ark, doesn't see the rain, it never, never rained before. And he's preaching righteousness and, um, and doesn't get any converts. Moving on. 
Then there came human government, where God allowed man to, to, to I guess, rule over himself. That ended with the Tower of Babel. And then we find that God looked for a man on the earth, and he wanted to set up a new dispensation. It was the dispensation of promise, where God found Abram. And God said, Abram, if you will get out of your country, get out of your father's house, and go to a place that I will show you that I'm going to make you great, and I'm going to make you a, a, a father of many nations. I will make your name great. I'm going to bless you. And I'll bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you. And in you, all of the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And this man said yes to God. And then the dispensation of promise started and it continued until they went into captivity in Egypt and it ended there. And then Moses brought them out and then Moses, God used him to start the dispensation of the law. And then the dispensation of the law went right through the whole, um, the whole period of Israel's um, authority and, that, and it ended at the cross And Jesus Christ was born under the law. He was born under the dispensation of the law. He lived and he died under that law. And then when he said it was finished, what had finished? Sin had been paid for. The old dispensation of the law had been finished. There was a new dispensation started, which was the dispensation of grace. Now you find if we actually have a look at all of these these, um, dispensations, as I sort of said, the common commonality with it was that man started it in his grace and his love, and man ended it with his sin. God started, sorry, thank you, thank you, thank you for my prompt. God started it with his graciousness and his love for us, and, and man ended up um, sinning, and, and, and God had to start again. It was interesting how during those times, Hebrews said that God spoke in times past in different ways. If you have a look in the beginning, in the, in the time of innocence, that God came and he spoke to man in the garden at the cool of the day, daily. Amazing. Face-to-face relationship. And I was sharing with the Bible college uh, about the God of love, that God created us to love us. And he created us for fellowship. And he wanted to come and be with us and spend time with us with someone that was his equal. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over this earth. God's got a planet called heaven that he rules over and the sides of the north. And he gave us this planet earth to rule and reign. And God would come visit our house every day. He translated himself. He's traveled at the speed of thought, I guess. I want to be there. And then he was there. Now, call of the day. And then sin locked God out. And you've got this amazing being who is a relational person. He loves people. He says, I am ever mindful of you. My mind is filled with you to have fellowship with you. But the sin and iniquity of man keeps God out. And so we find God visiting We find blood had to be spilt so that the the, the sin could be forgiven so God could come back into our lives and have some kind of relationship with us. And so God could no longer speak face to face with man. And you see the silent years, hundreds of years of silence where God would like to be involved in man's life. And we find God spoke to Noah and we see God gave him incredible instruction on how to build this ark and what it was going to look like. I mean, this is incredible engineering feat to be able to create this ark that was going to live on the water for for over a year, 40 days of rain, but then until the water subsided and to be able to feed all of these animals and house yourself. Incredible. God gave them instruction, but we can kind of get into our mind that God was visiting them and speaking to them on, on a daily basis. He wasn't. If you have a look here, the different ways that God spoke. In fact, I've got it written down there that after the fall of man, the way God spoke to man was infrequent rather than daily. If you have a look here, Noah, God spoke to Noah five times over 950 years. We can kind of, you know, think, my goodness me, over 950 years, five times. Abraham, eight times God came and spoke to him over a period of 175 years. And then you've got Isaac, there's two, two twice record, there's twice, uh, it's recorded, and one time with Rebekah over 180 years. Jacob, seven times, and one time with Laban over Jacob's lifetime. And so when we see God has spoken, this is why 
the dispensation of grace is so amazing because we can speak with God. God is inside us. We can speak with him daily. We can hear his voice. We can have incredible communion. And we look at all of these magnificent stories in the Bible. These people did not have a face-to-face, daily, moment-by-moment relationship with God, the God of love who wants to fellowship with us and be with us. Moses, come up the mountain and just be there with me. And Moses and Joshua, the only ones that went up the mountain, the other three million stayed down. And they couldn't come near God because of their sin. And God says, tell them not to come near the mountain. And if they do, they're going to, that the fire of God uh, will just burn up the sin that's in them. And so here we have this God of love that's wanting a relationship. But because of the sin of man, God is on the outside. And he has to stay away from these people because if he came near them, he'd kill them. And that's why blood needed to be spent all the way through the Old Testament. We think, gosh, this is a, this is a bloody kind of a, 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 a covenant. No, it wasn't. It was the grace of God so he could come near to the people. And then he had to hide himself in a tent. And then behind the tent was the inner court, the outer court, and the Holy of Holies. And behind the Holy of Holies was this big thick hide from top to bottom. You know, and, and again, if you have a look at this, here's this God and he's wanting to spend time with people. And there's one man that could visit God, one man once a year. And then that one man had to have a rope tied around his neck because if he had any sin and he'd go into the Holy of Holies, he would die. And so somebody couldn't come and get them because if they went in there, their sin would, they would die. And so they put a rope on him so that if he died, they could pull him out. Here's this God that loves people and he's the one that's in prison. He's the creator. And that's why when Jesus died and rose from the dead, it says that that veil was ripped from top to bottom, where God says, I'm out of here. I can come and be with my people, and I'm not just going to be with them. I'm going to get right inside them. So wherever they go, I'm going to go. They are going to be my temple. I don't want to be made, I don't want to be living in a temple made with hands. I want to be inside them. And fellowship with them. It's the most amazing love story that got the patience of God to work with sinful man that he loves. And it's interesting, here's another point. When God turned up on the scene in the Old Testament, it's interesting how we see that God never spoke um, to them or he did never address their personal sin, Rahab's sin. Or anybody's personal sin. He only addressed sin if it had anything to do with the redemptive plan of God. Otherwise, he, he, otherwise that, that sin was kind of just, it was a side issue. The main issue was getting the seed of the woman into the earth to bring redemption for all of creation. And so God was not drilling down on personal sin as such. He was looking at tracking and getting his son into the earth so that their son could be the last Adam and would die for the sins of the first Adam. And then the earth could go into a time of grace, which is what we have right now. It's an absolute amazing love story that, again, if you actually do a, a whole study on this, it's incredible to see the grace and the love of our Father. Praise the Lord. And so here we have... Um, you know, some of those dispensations, like I said, that God would speak to them in thunder and lightning and visions and dreams. And we have people right now running around the earth and running around New Zealand, wanting a prophecy and wanting a dream and wanting a vision and speak to me like that. We have got something better. We've got the prophet on the inside of us, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. And yes, we have prophecy. And yes, we have tongues and interpretation. But we're not to live by that. We're to live by the inner witness. When John says that you have an unction from the Holy One, he's right now inside you and you know all things. And you've got a more sure word of prophecy. um, That's the written word of God. That's far more sure as a word of prophecy than any other prophecy that you can receive. If we will go to that and look at that and live by that. And so it's not downplaying the lightnings and the thunders, you know, um, but, but that's not God's best. God's best is that we are intelligent beings, that we are filled with his Holy Spirit, that we are filled with his word, and that we are walking and talking with him 
in the cool of the day, every day, all through the day. That is God's best. Hallelujah. And so let's have a look at the dispensation of grace, this amazing time that we live in. We've come through all of these other times, and there's some descriptions there for you to, to read on your outline, but let's have a look here. So we're living in the time that is called the eight, the church age. It's called the time of the Gentiles. It's called, um, what else is it called? It's called the age of grace, the dispensation of grace. And so let's have a look at it here where Paul was talking about this to the Colossian church. And he says here, in Colossians 1.25, he says, Whereof, he said, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. And so this time period that we're in was hidden for 4,000 years. This period of the church age, it was a, a time, it was called a mystery, it was hidden. Um, and we don't find very much information about it in the Old Testament because it was a mystery. What did Paul say? He said, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now it has been revealed to the saints. And then it goes on to say, verse 27, to them God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is that mystery? It was God in us, the hope of glory. God couldn't get inside anybody else in any other dispensation, no matter how glorious it looked, that God was on the outside. But now God can get inside every believer. And so it's interesting that this mystery was hidden. The, the, and it's on your outline here, number A, that the writers, the prophets of the Old Testament, they may have written about our day in types and shadows, but they didn't understand what was coming. The mystery of the church age, I mean, you can sort of see small parts of it in, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, you can see that God promised it with, with, with Abraham when God said to Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. Well, that was looking forward to a time when Abraham is the father of all those who believe. And so Abraham's the father of the natural race. He's also the father of the spiritual race, race which is the believers. And so it was kind of um, inferred, but Abraham didn't know what that meant. When God said, hey, listen, look down at the sand, so shall your seed be. That's the natural nation of Israel. Look at the stars, so shall your seed be. What's that? That's the supernatural race, the church. And so there was types and shadows and pictures of it, but he didn't understand. And so you've got the angels. The angels didn't know. They didn't understand this, this, this new age, this age of, of, of grace that was coming. I better say not a new age. That's a delete so the angels didn't understand. Satan didn't understand what was coming. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2, 7, it says here that, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, Paul has said. He says, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. So Paul was carrying this mystery of the church age. And he goes on to say in verse 8, he said, which none of the rulers of this age had known, for, if they, for had they known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, if Satan had known what God was up to, he never would have crucified the Lord of glory. Why? Because now you don't have just one son, but you've got many sons in glory. He didn't realize that, that Jesus Christ was coming as the last Adam. Satan had come and taken the authority of the earth off of the first Adam, which gave Satan entry into this planet. It gave the entry to sin, to the curse, and to Satan, right from the get-go. And so Satan has been allowed to operate in this planet because the first Adam gave him his authority. And that's why God said at the very beginning to Satan, he sort of said, I'm going to put enmity between you and between her seed and your seed or your offspring. And you're going to bruise his he, uh, you're sorry, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. That was the first prophecy speaking about Jesus Christ coming. And so all through the ages, Satan was looking for a seed that was going to come, 
that was going to bruise his head. He was already looking for a Messiah. He was already looking for a Savior. And he was looking through the time to try and figure out what God was doing. So that's why when Moses came on the scene and it was time for deliverance of Egypt at that time, Satan knew it was time for deliverance. Moses' mother knew it was time for deliverance because she saw that her child was a special child. And so she was prepared to stand up to Pharaoh and say, no, you're not killing my son. And so Satan goes and inspires the Pharaoh to kill all of the young boys of that age so no deliverer would arise. And a deliverer did arise, but he was not the Messiah. He was a natural deliverer. And then we find coming down through the ages that there was a stars, that the men, the wise men saw that the stars were, were prophesying in the skies that the deliverer was about to come. Satan knew. Herod knew. And so he spiked and, 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 and inspired um, King Herod to kill all the baby boys at that time because they knew a deliverer was arising and Satan was going to try and knock out that seed. And God told uh, Josh, Josh, uh, Joseph, go down to Egypt because there's a man that's coming for his life and stay there until I tell you to come back. And so Satan, all through the ages, all through these dispensations, was watching to see what God was doing, trying to figure out this plan. And God prophesied every single part of the plan of our salvation and our deliverance. And then at the fullness of time, Jesus Christ was able to come onto the planet and do his work of salvation. And so he, Paul says here that had the princes known what God was up to, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That hallelujah. The, the curse was broken. Death was broken. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Jesus Christ took the, the keys to death, hell and the grave. He rose back out of there. And then he turned around to the disciples and said, all power has now been given to me in heaven and in earth. I've got the power back. I've got the power of the earth back. It's in my hands. I'm the last Adam. The first Adam messed up. I'm the last Adam. I took it back. Now you go with that authority and make disciples of all nations. Absolutely amazing love, uh, love story of God. And so we find out that the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was up to. The questions that they were asking, they thought Messiah had come. They received and they believed, yes, you are the Messiah. But they thought that Messiah had come to deliver them from the Roman, Roman rule, Roman empire, and then to set up his throne. And they couldn't understand what's going on. And then the crowds thought the same thing, because when Jesus came in to, um, came into Jerusalem before his crucifixion, and they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. They were quoting an Old Testament scripture that spoke about when Messiah would come. And it says, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they thought that this was Messiah coming to set up again his throne on the earth. See, they didn't realize that Messiah had come, first of all, to be the Lamb of God that would be slain for the sins of the world. And so he came as a lamb, but he's about to come as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so they missed this period called the two years, 2000 or the two days of the church age. And so it's interesting if we have a look here that Jesus' earthly ministry, where did that belong? It belonged under the dispensation of the law. And so Jesus lived, he ministered, and he died under the dispensation of the law. And he spoke, in, he spoke into, and primarily he was speaking to the nation of Israel. And yes, we can take the things that he has spoken and we can apply them to ourselves. You know, the, the, you know the, like, uh, you know, the parables and things like this. There's some things on our character, on, you know, sort of giving a glass of water in his, his name. We can actually use those and we can live by some of those principles. But some of the stuff he is specifically speaking to the nation of Israel. And that's where we need to discern what, is applies, what applies to the church and what is going to apply to Israel in the end times. Praise the Lord. And so... Let's just have a look here and just find out what God incorporated in our dispensation that was not included in any other period of time. And it says, first of all, number one, the new birth. 
being born again from death to life. That was not possible in the Old Testament. They needed the blood of bulls and goats that would cover the sin for another year, but they were still filled with death in their spirit. They had the nature of Satan in them. How do we know that? Well, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he said to them, you are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. What was he talking about? Was he insulting them? No, he was just speaking the truth. The first Adam was perfect and he was born of the Spirit of God. But when he sinned, he was born from from life to death. He took on the nature of Satan inside his spirit, which is death. He got born again from life to death. We get born again from death to life. God takes out the old spirit, the old nature, and he places a brand new spirit inside of us that is perfect and holy and cannot sin. And that's why we are the holy of holies now. God can come and live on the inside of us now. It's amazing. We're born again of the spirit of God. Satan is not our father. God is our father. That was not possible. Victory over Satan. We've got that now. Individually, you have the victory. You've got the victory over the curse. You've already got it. You've got the victory over death. We're not going to see death. We pass from death to life. We're just transitioning. If anybody packs up from this planet right now and your body, body runs out of strength, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Boom, just like that. That's amazing. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited about that. (laughs) Death, where is your strength? Sting, grave, where's your victory? I've passed from death to life. That's what Paul said. We know that we've passed from death to life. We've got victory over Satan. If there's anything hassling you, absolutely use the scripture. And just get off me. Get out of here. Off my family. I'm the one that's got the authority in the earth here. We are called kings and priests in the New Testament. Every one of us is a king. Every one of us is a priest. We don't just have one king and the rest of us are slaves. We're now heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We're now seated in heavenly places to rule and reign in this life by one Christ Jesus. That wasn't possible in any other dispensation. Get on your throne and start ruling. Start ruling. The Bible talks about where the king rules his power, a decree of a king. God says, you shall decree a thing and it will be established. That's what kings do. We decree things. Right now I'm saying no to things that are happening in my government. They don't realize that we're the spiritual government. And what we say no to is no. And what we say yes to is yes. And so start opening your mouth wide, God says, and let me fill it. And don't go under sin and death and the curse and people that don't know what they're doing. We're here to rule and the, and, and the responsibility for our nation rests on the church. The future of this nation rests upon the church and what we will do with our authority, what we will do with the word that God has given us. It's our responsibility. It's not God's. And it certainly doesn't belong to the unsaved people in this earth. This nation belongs to God, and we need to speak it out of our mouth. And God says, let your yes be yes, and your no be no. And if we don't like what we're seeing in our government, I'm saying no. No. You're not going to do that on my watch. I don't care what it looks like right now. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. God and inside us. Do you know that this is the most amazing thing? You know, as soon as, you know when, when you're sleeping and you wake up in the middle of the night, God's right there. When you wake up at six in the morning, he's right there. When you go to be the last thing at night, he's right there. He's, God says, I'm ever mindful of you. And my passion and my, my desire is, God, that I be ever mindful of you. You're thinking of me all the time. And I want to be conscious and thinking of you all the time. That may my heart and my life be a worship and be a pleasure to you. May I bring you that pleasure. 
for everything you've done for me. You know, when you feel like you want to pack up because things aren't going your way, just think of what, just think of who he is and what he's done for you and the calling that's on your life. God says, not one hair on your head. He says, I know the hairs on your head. Not one sparrow falls that I don't know about. Jesus is giving an example. If one sparrow falls and God knows about it, he knows about every intricate part of our life. Jesus didn't waste his words. And so when you think that, hey, things aren't going as they should, God knows and God feels it. And God's looking for faith in the earth. And he's looking for you and I to believe his word and not know that God's hand is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness. But he is long-suffering. And so God's working with your families right now. And it may seem like it's taking a long time. God has not forgotten them and he is working with them and he is negotiating because he's given man a free will and he will not override their will, but he will work in the situations and circumstances to move them into a place of his grace. And they're alive today because of the grace of God. And so thank God that your families are alive. That is the grace of God already. Because Satan, if he could, would like to take them out. And so your faith is standing that they are here, they're on the planet, and they're alive. And that the word is working. And the word and the seed that's gone into their heart, it is incorruptible seed. God is watching over that word to perform it. And he's bringing it to their remembrance in the night. He is doing that work. And we just have to just worship him. Thank you, Father. And so the priesthood of every believer, we don't, Jesus is our high priest and we can come directly to him any day, any time. Isn't that marvelous? Not possible in any other dispensation. And so just as I, just winding down here and and as I sort of said, I've just given us a background. What's not part of our mystery? What's not part of our, our, our time period? Well, the death of Jesus Christ wasn't. That was under the dispensation of the law. The The uh, resurrection was under the dispensation of the law until the Holy Spirit came and on the day of Pentecost, that new day started. Now saying that, you've got here that the tribulation. Stephen's been speaking to us about the signs of the end times and in Matthew chapter 24 up to verse 28, it says that you're going to see the beginnings of sorrows, it's going to see earthquakes in different places, And then after verse 8, the church is raptured. And then verse 9, you start to see the seven years of tribulation. It's kicking after that period of time. And then you start to see a very descriptive um, um, writings on, on the tribulation. And so we are not here. The tribulation period belongs to the dispensation of the law. It's the 70th week of Daniel. Daniel had 70 weeks. He had a vision of these 70 weeks of captivity, that Israel would go into captivity for 70 weeks, 490 years, because they had not let the land rest. And God said, I told you to let the land rest, and you haven't, so therefore there's going to be a a, a 70 years of sabbatical years where the land of Israel will rest, because you didn't let it rest as I told you to. And so there's... Um, there's a 39, sorry, 69 of those weeks that have pl- already been played out in history and you can see it prophetically. There's one week to go. One week of seven years that's left. And that is going to begin when the church is taken out. There's one seven-year period left of the dispensation of the law that will be played out. And the marvelous thing about it is you can see it's the dispensation of the law because the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the manifestations are going to be very similar to the time when God used Moses to go before Pharaoh and the judgments and the plagues and the stuff that was visited on Pharaoh, 10 of those plagues will be very similar to the manifestation of, 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 of judgments that will come on the earth during the tribulation. It looks almost like a double when you have a look. Why is that? Because it's in the same period, same dispensation, same period where you're going to see God arise in an incredibly strong way. Um, Praise the Lord. So the Battle of Armageddon 
as a part, is not part of the church age. As again, as a part, it comes under the dispensation of the law. And, um, and then we move, obviously, into the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to have a look at some of that stuff um, next week and, and just believe that um, it is, it's encouraging for us. That I let me just close with this. So what are we saying? That God's end time, end time prophetic clock is ticking. The church age, we're in our final, our final hours. Some people reckon we're in the final minutes. Um, we're occupying till we, he comes. We've got work to do on this earth. Yes, we can see a whole lot of things that are happening around, but we're not to be frightened and we're not to be concerned because the light of God is on the inside of us and the light that's in us is far more glorious and far more powerful than any devil, than any manifestation, than any government. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so as I sort of said, when the, this time clock, our, our clock finishes, there's another clock that's going to start and it's going to be the Israeli or the Jewish time clock and it's going to go for seven years. And then at the end of that time, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Messiah is going to come back with his saints, with us, with us to take up the earth, to lock Satan up for a thousand years and then he's going to rule as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords on the earth. Why don't we kind of... Kind of Get the worship team up here. So praise the Lord. We are the glorious church. We are the salt of the earth. We're going from glory to glory. And Jesus said, what's the point of having salt if it's lost its flavor? It says we, need, we, are, we are the preservative of the earth right now. We're here to preserve the earth. We're here as the light that the darkness cannot come in as it would like to. Because we are here. Isn't that marvelous? the authority that we have. And so, Father, we want to just thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Father God, that this was a theological, a theological session, a study, Lord God, to give us a, a big picture on what you are doing, what you have done, your grace. Lord, just to even be appreciative of who we are. Lord God, our relationship with you, that we can call you Abba Father. See, that's another thing. That no one could call him Father in any other dispensation. And not only Father, we can call him Abba Father, which means he's my dad. He's your dad. We've got an inheritance that he's given us everything. 